Okay, so I'm very happy to introduce our last speaker, who is uh, Victoria Osornova uh, from the uh, University of Bochum, uh, uh, who is uh, going to uh, complete the exposition that Martina uh, initiated on exploring infinity and categories through and completion sets. Uh, go ahead, Victoria. Thank you very much for the invitation and for the opportunity to speak here. And uh, as a last speaker uh, of the conference, uh, uh, let me thank for this great honor. And also it's my uh, great pleasure to ask everybody uh, to uh, unmute themselves for a second and thank the organizers for this great conference they put together. And uh, yeah, so I think it was a, a hard work in particular given the circumstances. So let's thank uh, the organizer. So thanks to the speakers. Thank you. Okay, so then I will go back to uh, uh, to infinity n categories, and uh, I will somewhat assume that you uh, have either uh, some idea of what an infinity n category is, or have listened uh, to Martina's talk, or preferably both. And so we are looking uh, on infinity n categories uh, through the eyes of n completion sets. And technically speaking, uh, I will not need uh, most uh, of uh, what Martina was saying mathematically, but uh, as we're human beings, we need to keep in mind some motivation for why are we doing things. And uh, this is uh, what uh, Martina have told you, has told you about. So we're trying to look at infinity n categories uh, and we're looking for particularly uh, easy model of uh, as all the models, uh, I would say, have their advantages and disadvantages. So there was a question in the chat uh, whether uh, it wouldn't be easier to work with theta n spaces. And in some, to some extent, this is true uh, in that um, theta n spaces are capturing the composition in a particularly easy way. But uh, in, in a different sense, mark simplicial sets, so this is what I'm going to use today, mark simplicial sets, which Martina has told you about, and I'll give you a, a quick recap in a sec. So they have uh, different advantages. So the composition is harder to extract, this is true. But uh, instead, uh, the underlying, uh, so the structure of what you have uh, the underlying category is very easy. And, it, and as opposed to the case of theta n spaces, it does not change uh, with n. So uh, if you have tried to list sort of all the uh, generalized simplices in a, of a theta two object, um, this gets, not, uh, this gets uh, unreared uh, in a very fast manner. And um, for mark simplicial sets, well, you need to say uh, what your underlying simplicial set is. So what is a mark simplicial set? It's a simplicial set, first thing, together with some extra data, which is also not too scary. So um, the, this extra data is marking uh, in all positive dimension. So for any uh, simplex uh, in, in your simplicial set, you just say it's either marked or not. And um, this is all there is. And I would say the simplicity of the model uh, is uh, for sure a plus. As we have seen, there's also a minus. So things get uh, more complicated in many places. If you want uh, uh, to go somewhat deeper, there, is, uh, there are several uh, further uh, things which um, um, are an advantage. So it's easier. So it's very easy to say what, what a join of uh, infinity n categories is in the language of uh, simplicial sets. And it's somewhat easier than in theta n spaces say to say what a, the great tensor product is. But uh, at least uh, I'm not planning uh, on going there today, but uh, I'm happy to discuss this at some other point. Okay, so a mark simplicial set is just a simplicial set with some marking in positive dimensions. And what you uh, should think of, uh, and uh, this is again a uh, um, quick recap of what Martina has said. So you should think of M simplices, roughly speaking, as uh, the encoding your M morphisms. 
And this is not completely true, as Martina was highlighting. Um, there's something weird going on here, since it has some with uh, some particular dis, um, boundary condition. But I think uh, for the purpose of the intuition, um, it's good to keep uh, this aside and just to think that M uh, simplicities are somewhat uh, uh, similar to M morphisms. And then the marked M simplicities on this side. You uh, can think about as M equivalences. And uh, actually, so Martina was saying uh, for, for the purposes of her talk, you could think about them uh, as M ISIS. And for the purposes of my talk, things get even easier. And uh, so in my talk, and actually only M dimensional identities uh, will occur for the most of the talk. Maybe uh, we'll come to something different in the end. So uh, structurally, uh, M identities would have different properties in general, but uh, for the examples we're going to consider in this talk, they will not matter so much. And Martina told you about uh, the uh, sanity check and also uh, about the indexing functor, um, about the possibility of getting some indexing shape from N categories into marked simplicial sets. And um, the goal for today is understand what this N sharp does to some basic shapes. So what I'm going to talk uh, about today is somewhat point set, uh, but it has applications to the uh, homotopy theory of, of the things uh, we are considering. So uh, we need to understand our point set model first in order to understand the homotopy theory, which, is, which it represents. Okay, so uh, Martina uh, described for you already that uh, the, even the easiest two category, which is not a one category you can think of, uh, or I can think of at least, the two cell has already a quite complicated uh, nerve. And uh, my first goal is to uh, make you somewhat more familiar what uh, this nerve is going to be. So for the purpose of naming, uh, let me call the things something. So I will, so the says, note that this does not have no non-trivial uh, composition uh, in any uh, degree. Uh, so you cannot compose non-trivially two cells. You cannot compose the one cells non-trivially. And still, um, the nerve is going to be huge, as Martina already told you. So let's try and unravel this a bit. And uh, I will repeat on the way what the, uh, the nerve was defined like. I, as Martina, I will not give you the full definition, but uh, I will give you some uh, insight maybe on what things go into there. Um, okay, so the zero simplices on the nerve of the nerve and R. Uh, so I need to describe to you two things. First of all, I need to describe to you a simplicial set. And this is what I will be doing for most of the time. And then I will tell you something about the marking. But the marking in this case is actually particularly easy. So uh, let's go with the simplicial set. So the zero simplices are, as you would expect, just the objects of your N category, in this particular case of a two category. So all the objects we have are X and Y. So from now on, I will only list the non-degenerate simplices, non-degenerate. So for zero simplices, of course, this does not make sense, but um, uh, for up one simplices and higher, I'm only going to list only them. Uh, so one simplices, there's still no surprise. This is as you would have expected from your usual nerve. You have two of them 
uh, which correspond to one morphisms, namely uh, F and G. So the two one morphisms, which I, you can see in the picture. But as Martina was pointing out, uh, we have for two morphisms, um, I need to not just specify a two uh, morphism, sorry, for, for the two simplices and not only specifying the two morphism, but also a compos uh, decomposition of its target. And uh, for the second, for a second, you might think, oh, but she just said um, there is no non-trivial composition. So which decomposition of target can I be talking about? Let me uh, show this to you. So this is somewhat what's, what's surprising to me is the first time I've seen this. Uh, so you would expect somehow to be able to encode your unique two morphism, non-identity non two morphism alpha in uh, the two simplices. And indeed you can do this in two majorly different ways. So you need your F to be um, the source of your two morphism, but now you can do two different things. So you can do X, X, Y, G, and you can fill this two simplex with alpha. So this is a two simplex uh, going from F to the composition of G with identity of X. Um, or you can do uh, the same thing, only that we compose G now with the identity of Y. OK. and. If you think about this for a moment, neither of these two simplices is going to be degenerate, and uh, neither of so then obviously non-equal. Uh, so these are two different uh, incarnations of my two cell so, uh, alpha. Even though we don't have no non-trivial compositions, these non-trivial comp this trivial compositions are already enough to uh, uh, infer the effect to different uh, incarnations of alpha. Okay, so three simplices uh, get even more exciting. So uh, let me cheat and show you the uh, picture of the three simplices you get. Uh, on the one hand, you might think, oh, but I don't have any non-trivial three cells. So how, uh, how can anything exciting happen? But if you play with it for a little bit, so you need to find out uh, what the uh, directions of the two cells are supposed to be. Uh, but this is still something you can draw easily. And uh, well, the three cells, of course, will be uh, will need to be identity three cells. You don't have anything else in your disposal in the uh, two category which we are considering. So let me maybe redraw it as a reminder here. We have our x, y, f, g, and alpha. So you might uh, think, uh, how can we possibly have a non-degenerate three cell. But again, uh, the, this nerve, the street nerve is not able, is not capable for any higher dimensional simplices to recognize whether it's an identity or not. For one simplices, this is still the same as in the usual nerve, it's uh, an identity if and only if it was degenerate. But for higher simplices, this is not true anymore. And if you stare at these simplices, uh, which combine the two different incarnations uh, either of each of them of uh, alpha. So uh, let me highlight this in the first picture. So one inc incarnation of alpha, we see it here, and one incarnation of alpha occurs here. And uh, both, so, uh, both of them uh, represent the same two morphism, but uh, they do not give you the same two simplex. And so the, the boundary pieces of this uh, three simplex are different. Okay, so it was somewhat non-obvious and you needed some guessing uh, on how to uh, see that these are actually all non-degenerate three simplices. So after you have uh, drawn some pictures of three simplices, you realize quickly 
that uh, drawing a four simplex into a plane is a somewhat challenging task. So you can do this. It's like a Maclean pentagon in, with some subdivision of its boundary. Uh, but it's still uh, quite complicated to uh, do. So you need a combinatorial tool uh, to handle these uh, nerves. And this is what I want to explain to you next. But I think uh, this is a good place to stop for a second and uh, ask for questions. Okay, um, then let's go ahead um, and see how can we possibly tackle this. So uh, one thing which you have um, when, uh, well, the nerve is going to be, as you might have guessed already, uh, right uh, adjoint, uh, just as the usual nerve is. And similar, uh, at least, on the underlying simplicial sets, this is uh, really easy to say. So the street nerve is co-represented by some co-simplicial object as any right adjoint uh, into simplicial set will be. So, and this is highly non-trivial machinery going into defining this uh, co-simplicial object called orientals. And this was done by street, um, I guess already some decades ago. So um, let me just, I will not give you a full definition, but uh, we will uh, want to think about uh, this co-simplicial object for a bit. So co-simplicial, um, Well, I can uh, look at it uh, in N categories, or if I want to be more general and uh, to, uh, well, some maybe somewhat answering the question which was asked before into omega categories. So uh, you might think about this as, it's not precise, but as the union of all N categories for all N. Um, this is not quite precise, but uh, for the second, maybe uh, this is, something which you want uh, to think. So there's this co-simplicial object, which uh, you call orientals. And this is co-representing the uh, street nerve. Okay, so, uh, such a thing, an oriental will uh, have something particular, uh, namely, uh, if we view it, it to it as, as an omega category, we can do something to it, namely truncate. And so if you want, if I start with some n category, say some, with some two category, and this is some feature of strict two categories, you can um, get an one category out of it in two different ways. So. Uh, let me say this in the case of two categories, two categories. And something similar occurs for higher n. So you can, out of a two category D, you can uh, uh, extract a one category in two different manners. So one of them uh, is uh, just forget that you ever had two cells, which is um, useful for some purposes, but not what I want to do right now. What you can do instead is uh, that you can just invert all possible two cells and, and in, not only invert them after a morphism, but make them into identities. So there are also more ways to go back and forth. Uh, I'm just picking two particular one, make all two cells into identities. Which uh, will identify a lot. And uh, this is the kind of truncation I will be talking about uh, when I say 
to one uh, to okay. Um, so uh, you can imagine the same procedure for any n categories going to get, get you into k categories for k smaller than n. And uh, if you want to, this to be more precise, you can phrase this as uh, be, having left and right adjoints to the inclusions of k categories into n categories. But uh, I don't want to go there into uh, too much detail. So for n orientals, uh, you will need to know uh, one further thing ex uh, besides the fact um, that it's uh, they're forming a co-simplicial object. Namely, I want, uh, well, for the moment, I want to tell you one further thing, namely that it's one truncation. So if I pretend that all my two cells are actually identities, will give you something very familiar, namely the, the um, just the category N of N composable arrow. And so something, uh, so what, how should you think about this oriental guy? This is like uh, N categorical simplets. And uh, it has this weird subdivision of the boundary, which you have seen in the examples um, of the NER, uh, but it's filled with some top uh, with a unique top N cell. And there's some weird law uh, by which you can deduce what the low dimensional cells are, which is not exactly easy. This is why I'm not presenting the details of it. Okay, so mapping this guy uh, into something is what uh, measures the, the nerve. So we, we uh, set out to understand the nerve with some marking, but first maybe the nerve without marking, let me remove it for the set. Um, we set out to understand the nerve of the two cells. So we need to uh, understand what a map from the oriental into the two cell is going to be. Okay, and the first thing I can observe is, well, from the two cell, I can collapse um, into, uh, um, I can collapse uh, the two cell again, take truncated. And the thing which I will get is very easy. This will be uh, just the uh, one symbol uh, or the category one. Okay, so this is an easy thing. And if you think about this for a second, uh, the composition of the map uh, of the oriental into the two cell into then uh, further to the uh, category one will factor through uh, the one truncation of the oriental. So we will get such a factorization. And I said uh, that this is just the category N. So a map, uh, a functor from the category N uh, to category one is also known as, or much better known as uh, N simplex of delta one. Okay. So N simplex of delta one, you might realize that as long as soon as N is going uh, to be big enough, they're all degenerate, but they want to keep something so you can enumerate all of them. And there's a, a good way uh, of uh, remembering uh, what, uh, what the simplex is, namely it's completely classified by the number and for uh, weird shift reasons, I will say by the number which I will call k plus one of vertices of n mapping to zero. 
So this will mean that sometimes this number will uh, turn out to be minus one since I can map to zero, uh, zero times, meaning that all, uh, all my simplex is just totally degenerate at the uh, end point one. And I can also map all of the n uh, plus one vertices of n uh, to zero, meaning it's totally degenerate to zero. And there's a bunch of other degeneracies in between. And of course, for n equals one, you also get the identity of uh, one. Okay. So this uh, was somewhat um, more complicated. Is there any question so far? So if, even if you could not follow the uh, details uh, of this, maybe the upshot of the uh, whole thing is that a simplex in the, this nerve has an invariant, which we'll call type. Of the nerve of the two sides. So will come to us with some invariant. And this invariant again measures um, in this n categorical simplex, how many vertices of it go to the uh, object X of the two cell and how many of them go to Y. And there's some index shift which you should not care about. Okay, so uh, having this, we now realize that um, the map we were considering, so this n thing, which was parameterizing our n simplex, actually factors through some quotient, namely uh, all the. Uh, you remember we uh, the orientals uh, form an um, object uh, which is co-simplicial. So in particular, I have an inclusion of first k vertices. Uh, first k plus one vertices uh, in into the uh, all of the n vertices and this k oriental so uh, sitting inside the n oriental will map completely to a single point to namely to x by the, the definition of my type so all of this all of this sub oriental maps to x Okay, so this is uh, this means that we could collapse this suboriental, and um, the map uh, would still make sense. Okay, uh, so I want to realize that we can collapse even more. Namely, we have something else sitting in the end oriental, namely the inclusion of the um, let me pick a different color. Um, last n minus k vertices, which are all mapped to y. So this will also uh, map to a single point, but a different single point. So as an upshot, what this will buy us is that any uh, n simplex of type k will actually factor as, uh, will define a map uh, from something else, uh, namely O n. And I could write this as a quotient, but uh, uh, you know, I can as well write it as a certain push out. Collapsing the two things which go to something degenerate, uh, factors uh, through something, factors through this guy. So going still to the two cell. Okay. 
So this means that we are interested in this push out. Understanding this would already uh, uh, lead us to somewhere. Any questions so far? Okay. So at this point, if you have ever tried to compute a push out of uh, categories or let's say amalgamated some uh, amalgamated product of groups you might uh, think oh no this looks pretty complicated like a pretty complicated push out of n categories i'm in trouble and to a certain degree this uh, is correct and to a certain degree it turns out not to be so bad after all so one uh, you can do one uh, more uh, simplification step Namely, this push out, you can actually uh, um, factor a, a little bit further so you, that you don't actually care about n categories, but only about two categories. And this is due to the fact um, that uh, our target is a two category. So actually factors even through, uh, the two truncation of this push out. And as a two truncation, which I described to you is a left adjoint, I can pull it in through uh, tor two. So the two truncation of ON, two truncation of OK. So there's no two truncation for the, uh, one point category this uh, is already as truncated as you might wish so um this uh is instead the guy we're now interested in and this has a very uh or comparatively easy uh, characterization in terms of things which we already know about but we need to uh, briefly recall and this is something which martina was already talk uh, talking about this is uh, the notion of um, suspension of higher categories, so suspension of categories in first place. So let me uh, see. Okay, so recall suspension. So we are aiming at, uh, to characterize this. Uh, let's look at suspensions again. Okay, so what was the suspension? The suspension is a functor which takes you from n categories to n plus one categories. You could do even something slightly different, but uh, let's stick with this. And so if you have start with the category D, let me draw the same cartoon Martina has drawn for you. Namely, we have two points in this uh, n plus one category and they need to tell you what the n category of morphisms between uh, the two points in any combination uh, is. So the only interesting one is going to be D and uh, put it uh, in this direction. And the other ones are uninteresting and uninteresting means two different things in this sense. So here we have just the identity and for, so as endomorphisms, we have just identities and we have an empty set of um, morphism or an empty category of morphism uh, back from the uh, target point to the uh, initial point. So if it does not speak to you, let's consider some examples. So let me start with some silly examples. Um, so first of all, uh, there's the empty category, which you could also suspend. So what you will end up with is just the n category, which will actually be a zero category if you wish, with two points. So there's no non-empty uh, mapping category between the two points. And uh, well, they are the identities of the two points, obviously. So that was a silly example. How about something maybe more uh, 
um, with more content. So let's suspend the category zero. So I have students have two points, they have identities and there's nothing going backwards from right to left. But now I have a single morphism uh, per, uh, which param parameterized by the single point I'm suspending going from uh, one morphism to the other. So you recognize the category one. So the suspension of zero is going to be one. Uh, so maybe I should say there's another notion of suspension. So I'm always talking about the two point suspension. There's another notion of suspension, which you might know from uh, monoidal categories, which is a one point suspension. This is not what I'm talking about. I'm not mentioning any one point suspension except at this place. So let's go one uh, categorical dimension higher. So let's suspend uh, one category, uh, one, non trivial one category. Uh, which we have not so far, the one category one. So I, what I do, I get, I get um, two objects as always. And now the two uh, objects of the category one get defined uh, for me two morphisms, one morphisms from one point to the other. And then the, finally the non-trivial one morphisms uh, of the category uh, one defines for me now a two morphism going between these. So this corresponds to zero smaller than one, if you wish. Okay, so uh, this is, uh, you as you recognize exactly the two cell we were talking about all the time. And let me uh, show you a slightly more complicated example. So you can also suspend more complicated uh, one categories in this, you can also suspend higher categories, but then I'm uh, running out of ways to draw something uh, eventually. So here I'm suspending the category one cross one. So what you should see is uh, you still have four objects uh, uh, in the category one cross one, and these correspond to the one morphisms which you see in the picture. So this one, this one and this one and the one behind, which uh, is uh, dashed. And between them, uh, you have the morphisms um, in, positioned in a square, so to speak. And uh, the two composition of two morphisms, uh, which you can imagine here, should coincide. So this is the two category which you obtain as a suspension of one cross one. Okay. So uh, this was a reminder on suspension. And I was uh, doing this, uh, promising you that we will characterize this uh, push out over here. So let me copy it uh, and tell you now in terms of the suspension functor, which we just learned about um, or re uh, reminded ourselves about if you already knew. Uh, so now I can formulate a theorem of Martina and myself, uh, which, which characterizes these guys. So how do I characterize this? Um, this is uh, isomorphic as a two category. So this is really not just an equivalence of two category, but an eyes of two categories. Namely, uh, it's as a morphic to suspension of a certain one category and which one category is this? Um, that's the cat one category K cross N minus K minus one. And so this would be correct if, if I would uh, want this for only single value of N and K. But if I, I want to have something natural in N and K, which I for sure will, uh, one, then I need to put an op here. Of course, in every single n and k, this will uh, be um, equivalent as a morphic to the category n minus k minus one. But uh, if I'm looking at the totality of all n and k's, this makes a difference. So this op is there for naturality of the isomorphism. So in particular, 
uh, for n and k equal one, uh, sorry, for n equals three and k equal one, you will recover precisely the picture which I have drawn uh, up there. So point um, this out, e.g. this upper guy for k equals one and n equals three. So that n minus k minus one is one again. Okay, any questions so far? Okay, then let me show you a bit how the, uh, this can be then used um, in order to unravel uh, what uh, what happens um, with the nerve of the uh, two cells. So how can we use this? Okay, so first thing uh, is a graphical uh, presentation of what I'm doing. So this category which we're looking at is a certain poset. And uh, this poset we can actually present as a, a grid of uh, a rectangular grid. So in the case one cross one, this would be easy. I could just draw this. And for higher n, I could, uh, and higher n and k, I could think of something like this. And every square which you see is supposed to be commutative. Okay, so this is something which you can think of, uh, uh, so something which you can keep in mind. And uh, so mapping out of a suspension of such a thing uh, into the two cell, which we just discussed to be the suspension of the category one, which was, uh, this was something which described the, uh, which was uh, coming from an any n simplex of type k in this nerve. And in particular, it's not just a map. Uh, this map is going to be also uh, preserve the two points. Uh, distinguished points. So you can convince yourself quickly that uh, a map between the two suspensions, but which just preserves the distinguished point amounts just to a functor of the categories which you were suspending. So this will translate for me into just a functor um, k cross n minus k minus one up to one. And so one more, uh, unraveling it one more uh, uh, step. So what is a function to one? There's not much particular uh, to happen there. We have this rectangular grid I had up there and I'm putting zeros and ones uh, on the um, nodes of this rectangular grid. And uh, it's just supposing uh, supposed to be um, weakly increasing in every indicate the direction indicated by the arrows. So numbers put on a, a rectangular grid are uh, also known as uh, matrices. I've taught a lot of linear algebra this term. Um, so so you have a matrix of 
uh, entries, which are all uh, zeros and ones. And they're supposed, the only condition they're supposed to satisfy is that they're uh, weakly increasing in these two indicated directions. And I just picked some directions which I like displaying. So these are, um, is now a very uh, combinatorial and very approachable characterization of all uh, n simplices of different types. And you can uh, figure out what the size of the matrix uh, is supposed to be given the size and the type of simplex. So uh, given this, uh, the dimension of the simplex, there's a fixed range of dimensions for the matrices. And so now this is a way to enumerate um, the simplices of the nerve of the two cell, which is much uh, easier uh, to approach than the graphical way we started with. In order to be completely honest, I uh, need to tell you also how to see in this matrix language what the simplicial structure is. And this is easy again. So uh, simplicial structure. is given for faces by removing a row or a column, depending on the number of the face, row or column. And degeneracies are given by repeating a row or a column. So in particular, you can see whether uh, a matrix is uh, giving you a degenerate simplex or not, but just looking at whether it has two equal rows, which needs them to be consecutive because of the uh, monotonicity, or two equal columns, which will also need to be consecutive. So these are how you recognize whether a matrix is defining for you a non-degenerate simplex or not. So this is a combinatorial description we can work with. So let's go back to the Simplices we already knew and give them their new combinatorial names. So the zero simplices are somewhat special. Let me leave them uh, out. So what about the one simplices, and the non-degenerate ones uh, are F and G. And if you figure out the dimensions, they will correspond to one cross one matrices and uh, with only entry zero or, or one, well, there are two of them zero and one. Okay, no surprise so far. So the two simplices, uh, we had, had two manifestations of um, alpha. So this was this one. And the other one, which was Now uh, I, I'm looking, so these are where the non-degenerate ones and uh, the total number of uh, rows and columns for the two simplices, for the matrices in two simplices is going to be three. There's a weird dimension shift, which uh, I'm sorry about. So uh, this one is going to be zero, one, and this one is going to be zero. And uh, finally, for the three simplices, you can uh, figure this out as well. So what you obtain here is uh, that this uh, upper one uh, is going to be the uh, corresponding to a matrix zero, 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 one. And this one is going to be corresponding to zero, one, one. Okay, so this is what the three simplices are um, in the terms of matrices. Any questions so far? Okay, so now you can imagine uh, that uh, this language now allows you, for example, to figure out what the non-degenerate four simplices are. So you need to find all matrices whose number of row and columns is summing up to five and such that no two rows and no two columns repeat and the uh, entries are zero and one and weakly increasing. So, 
I think uh, this is a good time to take a five minute break. And if, you, if you're uh, still following and uh, you want to have a small exercise, you can try to figure out what all these matrices for the four simplicities are. And uh, otherwise you can get a coffee or something and we'll, uh, I would uh, continue in five minutes. Okay.
Okay, let's resume from here. So let's uh, recap what we're doing. So we set out to understand the nerve uh, of the two cell in the model of uh, Mark simplicial sets or of n simplicial sets. And uh, we, uh, to, for this, we provided a somewhat combinatorial description of this guy. And we're still uh, aiming to at least out of this combinatorial description guess, to get some understanding of what the simplicities look like. And uh, I just asked, um, so the combinatorial description was given by matrices, uh, rectangular zero uh, with zeros and ones, weakly increasing. Um, the non-degenerate ones uh, do not have um, repeating rows or or repeating columns. And um, the, for the four simplices, the total numbers of rows and columns uh, is uh, going to be five. So for example, you could have a one cross four matrix or two by three or three by two or four by one. And um, yeah, so I was asking whether we can, uh, given this data, already figure out what the um, for non-degenerate for simplices of this guy are. And uh, I had got already one correct answer from the audience. Any further guesses? Uh, how many are there? Or um, what do you think, uh, how unique this is? How difficult is this? Okay, so you quickly figure That's out that Something Sorry? like something like a simplified version of a parallelo piped, but in geometry. Simplified version of the parallel piped. I'm not quite sure. Probably meaning the right thing. Um, so yeah, you're right. Uh, so there's uh, there's. Um, so you, you quickly figure out so that for one cross four and four cross one, you will need to repeat uh, a row and column. Uh, and for two by three and three by two, there's only one possibility to have no repeating rows and no repeating columns uh, in each variation, namely uh, the two by three is like this and the three uh, uh, by two is like this. And uh, if you think about for a little longer, um, more generally, if you fix the total number of row and columns, there are only two matrices uh, which uh, can be uh, to have uh, with this fixed number, uh, no repeating rows and no repeating columns. And uh, they're both quadratic if uh, you are, depending on the parity, they're either both quadratic or of the size uh, k and k plus k cross at k plus one and k plus one cross k, as we see in the case of four synthesis. And in total, you can derive precisely the theorem, uh, which Martina was presenting to you before, but let me restate it. Um, the nerve of the two cell has two non degenerate synthesis in uh, any dimension. In any given dimension. Okay, so now let's think of uh, pause here for a second. So the cell is pretty interesting, uh, but maybe we want uh, to aim for something more general. So for the longest part of this argument, what did we actually use about the two cell? And if you think about this for the moment, so in the uh, this very last, last bit, we actually used that we only have zero and one. But before uh, to get the description as um, functors from certain one category into uh, something, we, the only thing we actually used, and this is same, uh, like the more general version of this theorem. So maybe let me give it two parts. So first, still a point set uh, uh, part of this theorem, namely uh, the, the only thing we actually used for the longest time is this being uh, 
in suspension to category. And this is something which we can make more general. So now for the suspension to category D, so let me maybe go back briefly and show you what changes were. So we had this bit. So uh, we could describe this nerve by having the functors. So first we had the functors from uh, this blue guy here into the category, uh, the two category uh, suspension of one, which we identified with these functors. Now, if our two category happen to be not suspension of one, but suspension of some other category D, this would be, uh, have worked all the same. And uh, this uh, preserving distinguished base point would be still the same. And uh, we would get functors from k across n minus k minus one up into t. And uh, like this last step, of course, does not work the same. But uh, until there, uh, we, we are good. And so uh, the n simplices of this are in one to one bijection with, uh, you know, uh, you first have to take uh, the disjoint union over all the possible types of the simplex, which you still have uh, as a notion um, for any suspension category D. And uh, this is K cross N minus K minus one up to D, just functors. Okay, so this is a one-to-one -one correspondence for every fixed dimension N. And there's again a way of making this into a uh, bijection of simplicial sets where I have not told you exactly what the simplicial structure is right, uh, like on the right, but it's not hard to figure out. Okay, and this description is now so explicit that we now you can use this point set description to do some homotopy theory. More precisely, this uh, as a corollary, we can then prove that. Um, um, the suspension of the nerve of D. So D is now a one category for any one category D. Um, we get an uh, equivalence uh, between this usual nerve of this usual one category suspended in uh, the sense of uh, simplicial sets or more precisely of marked simplicial sets. Uh, into the nerve of suspension of D. So um, the suspension is a kind of a, um, left, uh, is a co-limit construction, if you wish, uh, a kind of left adjoint. It will not play well uh, in general with the nerve. And on the nose, this is not going to be an isomorphism. But uh, we can, uh, due to this explicit description we have, we can show something, namely that it is an equivalence So you have this natural map, and it turns out to be an equivalence of uh, in in the model structure of marked simplicial set with the infinity two model structure. Okay. Questions so far? Okay. So let, now let me uh, say very briefly uh, how. Um, this can be then used um, in order uh, to, so let me talk a little bit about this theorem, which Martina also mentioned already, which is joint work also with Julie Bergner. So let me uh, get somewhat more precise. I will say something about this uh, um, in a sec, so uh, we can, Uh, take this um, theta two spaces and we can map them by a functor, which I will characterize in more detail in a sec, um, which I will call L, since it will be a left Huon functor uh, into Mark simplicial sets with the infinity two model structure um, is. And I have not told you what the functor is yet, but I will, uh, will give you some details in a sec, is an equivalence, uh, equivalent equivalence.
So in order uh, for this to make sense for you, I have to tell you at least something about the left-hand side. And uh, the left-hand side uh, is defined as uh, first a pre-sheaf category on or simplicial pre-sheaves on some category theta two. So I need to tell you at least a little bit of this uh, theta two uh, uh, and remind you if you know already. So theta two, uh, as we uh, said before, theta two is a more intuitive um, encoding of the uh, idea that an infinity two category uh, should have all possible compositions of um, two cells. And, um, maybe in this case, all possible means somewhat elementary uh, composition. So uh, for one cells, uh, for one morphisms, there is only one way to compose one morphisms and they are either composable or not. But for two morphisms, you have already seen in Martina's uh, talk that, um, that even two elementary composition operation, namely you can compose two morphisms uh, vertically or horizontally. So let's have something like this. And uh, the category theta two is um, recording for you all possible combinations of such compositions. Uh, so um, where you only have vertical or horizontal uh, compositions at once. So let's let me draw a typical element for you something like this. So this is a two categories and the category theta two is going to be a full subcategory of two cat, full subcategory. And I will say that the objects encode uh, combinations of vertical and horizontal compositions. Or put slightly different, I can use the notion of suspension, which I would just had before. And I recognize that all the uh, columns in the two category I just have drawn are suspension categories of certain cat uh, categories in Delta. So this is a suspension of three. This is a suspension of two suspension of zero, suspension of one, and suspension of one once again. And so uh, I can, in a slightly different manner, I can also think about objects of theta two as consecutive gluings. Gluings of suspension and K for varying and uh, for varying and I um, head to tail, if you wish. Okay, so obviously this is not a precise uh, definition, but uh, maybe you uh, get some feeling for what it is. Okay, so Theta two is a small category. We can take simplicial pre-shifts on this category. And these simplicial pre-shifts uh, carry, so they take functors from the category theta two up into simplicial set. And this carries a mod a different model structures. So in particular, I can start with the kahn quillen model structure on simplicial set. And there's a small technicality in this. I take the projective model structure. So if you are uh, familiar with um, this context, it would be more uh, usual to take the injective one, but for our purposes, the projective one is the right one. Um, both of them exist and are good for different purposes. So uh, we can take a projective model structure of uh, on this functor category and localize. So in, this will not model for you the infinity two categories, um, but uh, this is uh, nice this category to obtain the model uh, this um, 
with respect to the following classes of maps, um, to, to the following classes to obtain a model for infinite two categories. And what I'm saying now is due to risk. So uh, to look, uh, we'll localize this with respect to four kinds of maps. And two of them are e very easy to explain and two of them are maybe somewhat more mysterious. So the easy to explain one are um, the ones uh, capturing the composition. So these will be one and two. So first one, let's look at this guy. Okay, uh, now something subtle will happen in a sec. So I'm gluing two, two cells. This is, these are not all of them, but I, this is the prototypical example. And I will look at the map into this. Okay, so now you would, you should think, oh, something is odd. Uh, she just said uh, this uh, gluing is just the definition on the right hand side. And in a certain sense, you're of course correct, but uh, in a different sense, uh, this is the definition. And let me explain to you the difference. So on this left hand side, this push out is happening in pre sheaves, uh, in simplicia pre sheaves uh, on uh, theta. So, so to speak, we have taken the nerve, the nerve in this particular model, which means the representable discrete pre sheaf and have glued uh, the pre sheaves in, uh, in the pre sheaf category. Or we have glued uh, the two categories first and then taken the nerve, nerve of the glued two category. And again, you will recognize my favorite theme. We are trying to commute this push out with uh, the right adjoint, which is the nerve. And most of the time this will go wrong. Uh, but in some, uh, but what we impose uh, as a condition in this case is that, well, up to homotopy, this is uh, indeed equivalent uh, in taking this particular kind of push out in uh, pre sheaves uh, so after taking the nerve and before taking the nerve should be equivalent in uh, two categories. And similarly, um, you will impose the same thing for a different push out, namely for the push out recording the vertical composition, whereas the first push out recorded for us the horizontal composition. So the, you will localize with respect to something. Uh, sorry. Now the map goes the wrong way. Uh, so I need to glue the upper cell with the lower two cell along the uh, uh, one cell which they're glued uh, along. So let me maybe highlight which one cell I mean. This is the source of this two cell and the target of this one. And it becomes the one here. And the same story uh, repeats here. We, uh, trying to commute some kind of nerve through the push out. And this push out on the right hand side is again taken in pre sheaves, whereas the push out on the left hand side it take, is taken in two categories. And maybe in the interest of time, there are two, kind of, uh, two kinds of completeness conditions, which I will not go into the details of, of completeness. So if you're familiar with uh, complete zero spaces, uh, one of them will be literally the completeness of complete zero spaces. And one of them is actually the suspension. Now the suspension in the language of theta uh, two sets, uh, sorry, theta two spaces um, of the uh, classical completeness condition. So in particular, if you want uh, to know that uh, the functor which you defined, namely the functor uh, now I uh, can define for you from theta two of simplicial pre sheaves to mark simplicial sets. And I need to tell you what it does on a representable and let me take a non-enriched non representable meaning an object of theta uh, together with an object of delta. So. Uh, I'm viewing this as usual pre-sheaves 
on theta two cross delta. Then I will map this into the nerve and the marking which Martina explained to you of theta cross delta k. Now endowed with the maximal possible marking, all non uh, all positive dimension simplices are marked. So this guy. Um, uh, this is a functor which, uh, well, you need to uh, define, of course, the maps on uh, theta 2 uh, cross delta in order to then left can extend it to a left adjoint functor. But this produces for you a left uh, adjoint functor. And now I need to tell you uh, that it is compatible with the model structure in first place. And so you need to check independently that L is compatible with the uh, projective model structure on the left hand side. And this is the place where we need projective as opposed to injective with projective model structure. And once you have this, you will need to ask yourself, well, now what does this uh, uh, L do to the um, things which are localized with respect to? And it, so you will need to check that L takes maps of type one to four to weak equivalences. So let me focus on maps of type two, since this will be roughly uh, equivalent. Uh, so you will need to know that L of this guy and well L is a left adjoint so you will uh, be able to pull it into the push out these guys so you will need to know that this map is a weak equivalence. And if you think about it for a little bit, uh, this will correspond to the fact that the nerve of this guy, natural one, and the nerves, sorry, I'm still ahead of myself. Natural nerve of two copies of the two cell glued along the natural nerve of the one cell, well, this will be just the one simplex. There's no surprise there. You need to know that this map is a weak equivalent. So these are uh, replacing equivalently uh, uh, values on the right and left hand side. But wait, this we just understood in a, a better way. So this is nerve of suspension of the category two and uh, this is nerve of the suspension of the category one on well, two times and if you want you can even replace this as a suspension of zero okay but for this we just found a much more manageable model so you take the suspension of the nerve of the category two okay nerve of the category two this is delta two this is something i'm pretty familiar with on, and on this hand side, uh, it's nerve of the category one. So it's suspension of one glued over delta one with the suspension of one. And now uh, this reduces you to a really finite problem. So we set weak equivalences here. And now it's really easy to write down an explicit weak equivalence in uh, the language of um, um, complish and complish sets on uh, below here. And this shows to you that this and in turn this is going to be a weak equivalence. And of course, this is only a special case. You need to do this more generally. And you can also recognize that uh, the wedge theorem, which Martina was uh, talking about, goes into proving that uh, this one is a weak equivalence. And let me uh, mention on one place where we, you actually, so, so far there were no isomorphisms anywhere, but actually in the completeness conditions, they do enter the scene. And there we need actually uh, to deal with the isomorphisms uh, as in the market. Yeah, so um, this maybe uh, should illuminate on how the uh, 
technical things uh, like the point set understanding of the um, suspension uh, of the nerve of a suspension categ two category enters um, the proof of the equivalent uh, pair. And then the, for the equivalent equivalences, we need uh, totally different methods based on uh, work of Bavik Shoma Priest and Ganya Harpat Lanar. Yeah, so let me stop here. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, uh, Victoria, for your very nice talk and also with a lot of uh, very uh, hands-on uh, calculations that uh, I tried to follow. I did not always succeed, but it gave me a very good uh, idea of what one needs to grasp this original way of looking at things. Uh, are there any questions? Oh, I can see there is one in the in the chat. Let me read it out. What do you expect the natural nerve on a non-walking three cell look like? Uh, non three non-degenerate cells in every dimension, or does it explode more? So, uh, what do you mean by non-walking? Do you mean walking? I assume. I'm sorry, I meant walking. Yes. I, uh... Yes. Um, I think it explodes even more. Uh, yeah, so you already have much more. Uh, so you have already two in a, a walking uh, three cell, you already have two different, two simplices. So even on the level of two simplices, I already see four different ones. And for the three cell, you will already have uh, at the very least four, no more uh, different, uh, uh, witnesses for the existence of the three cell and it uh, so we have certain ideas on how this would look like um so maybe i can tell you one thing so we had this quotient uh, of the um truncated guys so we took the truncated and oriental and uh with truncated the k and the n minus k oriental uh we were collapsing. Um, so and we collapsed it to something and sorry, uh, and this was easy to um, characterize as a suspension of a certain one category, which is not surprising since uh, well, we had the two category here. So this was k cross n minus k minus one. And there was this op for functoriality for naturality. But uh, we actually know by now, uh, so this is relatively new, uh, what you get if you don't collapse, uh, sorry, if you don't truncate, and this needs totally different combinatorial methods in order to prove this. And I'm happy to comment about this uh, a sec. So uh, it looks somewhat similar, you get a suspension. So let me copy this first and then I will make uh, make something different. Sorry, uh, Alice something. Um, N minus K minus one. So this was uh, if you took the truncation. Now things get more complicated if you don't truncate. So instead you get the orientals here. And now the product is unfortunately like the tr one truncation of what you see will be the product, but the thing which you actually get is a gray tensor product. And uh, then the op uh, becomes the total op, which means op in all uh, positive dimensions. So this is something we can prove by now. And uh, so this, um, there are different ways to, of uh, seeing this. And one of them, uh, so I think a nice, um, more conceptual way of seeing this is uh, now uh, could uh, can rely on the uh, work of Felix Lobouton, uh, which uh, Martina was mentioning before, sorry. So, so it's not equal, but it's actually isomorphic as N categories. And so you, you can now, uh, for, for any given dimension, you can sit down and figure out what this looks like for the three cell. I think this is still manageable, though I have not done this. Uh, but um, 
um, so yeah, so let me say that this great end of product complicates things a lot. So cross product, uh, usual Cartesian products, just much more easy, much easier. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. I, are there any more questions? So, if not, let's uh, thank Martina again and I. Sorry. <laughs> again and uh, also uh, all all the speakers of this morning and all the speakers of the workshop and all the participants and the CRM and, and the scientific committee and all the institutions that help us through. And you, thank Ima, you. and Andy, for all the work that you have done. Yes, thank you for organizing. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.